Hey everyone, welcome to the GIST Podcast. If you're tired of being comfortable and want to take on living life from the context of 100%, fuck yeah! Join us each week as we share lessons we're experiencing in this crazy game called life. We invite you to play along and get your shit together. Take responsibility for how your life is currently going, and at the same time, take on new, fun, and sometimes crazy shit. We promise to challenge your thinking by being vulnerable, authentic, and straight up with what we're dealing with, what doesn't work, and what can. Be warned, this is not your grandma's podcast. Yay! David, you're back! Welcome to episode 53 of the Just Life podcast. It is a new year and a new beginning. It's the perfect time for you to start living your best life on your terms. Our Just Life community believes that this is possible for anyone who is willing to choose it and willing to look in the dark corners of your life and to deal with the shit that isn't working. We are on a journey to design and create a vibrant, thriving, connected community that fuels dreams. This is a selfish interest with a covert passion to realize our mission and have you living your best life on your terms. And we're missing Wakefield, unfortunately, so we, yeah. won't, uh, we won't get dropped with some of his brilliance this morning, which is too bad, but all good. Um, welcome back. Happy New Year. Feliz Año. I was in Mexico for three weeks. Fantastic. Yes. Maya, Maya, Maya my wife, was there for five weeks. We do that every year. Where were you? Uh, Acapulco, actually. Oh. Yeah. Normally, we would go into Mexico City and stay there for a while. I asked that we not do that this year because it's a lot of family and I just get bored and in the corner because I really don't speak. Uh, so we just went to the hot beaches right away. And uh, I was totally down with that. I enjoyed it. It was, it was a good trip. You have to see Roma. Roma? Have you not seen Roma? I don't think so, no. Oh, it's a fantastic film about Mexico oh, City. And, right. uh I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. I will. You should, too. <laughs> I should. So we have another guest joining this morning, um, Doug Bowie. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, it is. Welcome. Good morning. So Doug is a coach and mentor to presidents and senior executives at the enterprise level. He knows firsthand what it takes to make cultures that succeed and grow. He's the author of four books, which we'll post in the show notes, and uh, has taught negotiation and counseling at the UFC and was resident lawyer there. That's correct. He's traveled the Camino de Santiago three times so far. This is the spiritual pilgrimage thousands take across Spain and have taken since the Middle Ages. His first spiritual trip changed his life, and we will most definitely talk about what that was and last year doug and a colleague launched the camino channel with on location interviews of the pilgrims who travel the route and why they do it he's a writer a painter a husband and when he's not shifting paradigms in large organizations you can find him hanging with his dog his family and dog geo at their place on hornby island so welcome to the just life doug thanks a lot yeah you're welcome uh we met I'll by, I'll be a, a bit briefly. Sure. Um, at Creative Mornings, and you heard me do something for the very first time. Yes. Um, thank you for for being there to experience that. It was absolutely transformative. I thought uh, your courage and uh, your forthrightness, your acuity in identifying what you know you meant to say was absolutely riveting. Wow! Thank you. That is really cool to hear <laughs> yeah. i know it was a big step for you and i'm i'm very glad you took it yeah well and uh funny enough i'll be doing a similar version of that one to now a group of about two thousand people wow so it just kind of like ramped up real quick and uh well this this year this game what we've been playing is all about just throwing your hat over the fence taking the dive and yeah um and and really uh, stepping into greatness right what does that look like mm -hmm. so thank you that uh that's uh i'm shitless scared shitless of the of the idea the the journey and, and at the same time so excited about um what's possible mm -hmm. and the idea of like just really truly being myself in front of a whole group of people 
knowing that that would actually make a difference for some people and make a difference for myself, like to really be able to step into that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I look forward to what that journey brings. Well, it's, it sounds it's like exciting. you're off on a, on a pretty good start. Yeah, I think so. But this podcast is not about me. Not today. Anyways, normally well, it is about to watch it it because I'm, is. I'm a coach so that, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to end up interviewing you. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and a veteran coach at that. Totally. Yeah. It actually did, did get pivoted there quite quickly. All right. That's because I'm trying to do my best to keep my big yap shut. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, so 1999, that was when you did your first walk. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I had... It was spur of the moment. Well, sort of spur of the moment. It, 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 it went like this. I was, um, at that time, I was a lawyer doing uh, native work, and I was in Edmonton at a meeting. And I had a meeting in the morning and a meeting in the afternoon, and I had about two hours in between. And I'm an inveterate bookstore hound. Yeah, nice. And at that time, there was a marvelous bookstore called Audrey's Books on uh, Jasper Avenue in Edmonton. And so I'm idling and I, I, I just wandered into Audrey's and I just felt like I was guided. And I, I went uh, through the stacks and I went over here and down that aisle and picked up this book. And the book was called something like The Wizard's progress or something like that. But it was written by a renowned uh, Brazilian man named Paulo Coelho. Mm. And uh, you may have uh, seen others of his works. But in any event, uh, I just started reading it right away. And it was uh, uh, his a magical realism story of the pilgrimage that he had done. Um, and I just said to myself, well, I'm going to do that. Mm. And uh, I, I, so we had, uh, at that time, I was, I was just beginning my progress of, um, of mentoring CEOs in uh, an organization called Tech, the Executive Committee, which is a worldwide organization for presidents, now called Vistage Worldwide. Okay. And uh, so in our retreats, we used to um, put up art art boards and put post-it notes on them of the things that we were intending, each member was intending for themselves in the following year, the upcoming year. And then we would we would go around as a group and speak to each of those and question them and amp them up. Um, but mine, I had put pilgrimage hmm. on this. And I'd been putting it on that board for about three years. So before you even read the book? No, before, after I read the book, but before I did it. I see. Yeah, I'd yeah. been kind of stewing on this as an intention. Yeah, right. And, uh, and don't we all do that? I think it takes a fair while to gestate sometimes, yeah. you know. And then um, uh, one of my uh, vibrant members, Derek Bullen of SI Systems in Calgary, came up beside me and said, what's this pilgrimage thing? You, you've put that up before. I said, yeah, it's, uh, it's the pilgrimage to Santiago written in this book that I read. And so he, he questioned me a little bit about it, and then he turned to me and he said, I'll do it. Hmm. And that was it. We were in the, pro in the process of, uh, of uh, going there. You found a compadre. We had a compadre, had a compadre and Derek, and, and it was so exciting because, you know, at that time, um, it was not well known at all. Mm -hmm. And um, we were preparing. Um, we had a marvelous time uh, meeting and talking over all the things that you had to have. And, of course, we were overpacked like nobody's business. <laughs> nice. But we were <laughs> packed for kind of like a journey to the desert sands, you know. Right. We thought that's Lawrence of Arabia, Spain, after all, you know. <laughs> well, approximately when was this? Like around what year? 1999. 1999. God, so there was. Sounds old when you say it that when way. When you say it that way, yeah. <laughs> so, because cause I'm, I'm tracing back and trying to remember, like, how much uh, was the internet involved in your research? Well, I was just going to come to that, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was uh, completely off my radar, but not off Derek's because he was a, a modern guy, I much younger than I. And uh, so. We decided a week before, you know, he says, I'm going to show you something. We're going to check the weather. 
in Santiago. <laughs> and so he looked it up online. Says, this is a miracle. You wow. know? <laughs> and, and just before that, I'd been looking with my daughter at an atlas. You know what an atlas is? Yeah. You know, like, you know, <laughs> that's actually a question you have to ask no, now. No, it is. Yeah. It's great. Oh, it's man. Great. Well, I was being mindful of, of some of our listeners. I'm thinking, this is a great story, but I, I actually want to give them some perspective on what it takes to prep for a trip. The difference for preparing for a trip 30 years ago in, in comparison to today is it is Pretty like different. a different universe. Right? <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. So we were looking at this atlas and it had, uh, we were looking at Spain and, you know, it had minerals and it had this oh, and wow. that and the other right, thing. Yeah. But it did have a weather chart and it showed precipitation. And I said, gee, that's interesting. There's this great big blue blob over here because Santiago itself is on that portion of Spain that's above Portugal. It's right near the Atlantic Ocean. And so when Derek looked at the at the forecast for Santiago, it said 55 rain, 55 rain, 55 rain, 55 Not a rain. desert experience. Not a desert. Mm -hmm. So we immediately ran down to Mech and got all the wet weather keep warm gear we could think of including Gore-Tex socks you know we had <laughs> did you try those on oh yeah were they comfortable not really but they uh, <laughs> they kept you dry I say yeah uh, at the end of the day sure enough it was it was wet it was really wet is wow. that right oh yeah wow and did that make it uh more interesting or miserable in your uh at well, the time it started off being a trial because when we got there, we took a bus up to the highest point before the Camino reaches Santiago. It's 150 kilometers out. And we figured this was going to be our, our stretch we were going to do. 150 kilometers on the ground is about, you know, six, seven days. What's the walking. total uh, trip? It depends on where you start because the, the, the Camino is a very traditional expiation rite that Catholics used to undertake to wash away their sins. Mm. So it, there were actually, there are Camino trails that initiate from all over Europe because if you were sentenced, and that's how it was back in the golden days of Catholicism, if you were sentenced to a Camino, to a pilgrimage, you had to leave your town with nothing and walk from there all the way to the cathedral and back. And if you made it, it was kind of like a trial by fire that showed that you were okay. Um, and you got your absolution when you got to the cathedral. So um, the traditional though classic route is what's called the Camino Francaise. And it starts in Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port on the other side of the Pyrenees mm. and goes across the northern part of Spain to Santiago. Wow. 800 kilometers <clears throat> is the classic route. That's quite the walk. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very long walk. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. We experienced something very similar, much smaller, in Mexico City. Yes. During, uh, in around the, the Christmas holidays, and, and you'll have to forgive my, I don't know anything about this. It's not really a thing on my radar. But there will be people um, walking through, or there'll be uh, caravans of cars and people walking through the downtown, uh, the, the, the downtown core of Mexico City, going somewhere. I have no idea where. Um, the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. Probably going to Guadalupe. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. The cathedral yeah. of the Black, the Black Madonna at Guadalupe in northern Mexico City. Everywhere. It's it's crazy, and they're doing very much the same thing. Like there is. There is something that they are, are looking for forgiveness around or uh, to be inspired by. What would it be like if people today had the opportunity for contemplation? Oh, I think that they're horribly missing that. And that's one of the reasons why we decided to do the Camino Channel was because we wanted to show people who might be interested not so much the logistics and the arrangements, which is what we were just talking about, mm. um, but more the elevated state mm. that people achieve when they're walking. Mm. Because it's very special and it's very much divorced from technology, immediacy and all that. And people really come in touch with themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so scarce. 
because it's almost impossible to achieve immunity from this hail of technology and, and I stimulus. Agree. It's impossible, impossible, but also um, even to be aware that it's something that you need because because we're now being born into that not being a thing. Yes, that's at right. All right, and it's been so long that you know perhaps you or I have had that that we even forget that how how refreshing that was. Yes, you know and. and what that might make possible today. Yes. So what do you say to that? Well, I think that, you know, it's the only way you're going to be able to jump the tracks. If you're on a life that is not fulfilling to you, it's not getting you where you think you need to go or want to be, the only way to do that is to radically alter your context. And so I've, I, you know, I've also spent considerable times on, on the vision quest, which is a Native American right, of again isolation a similar context it's um it's out in nature so it's similar yes it's similar in that way um but i think what happens for people is uh, as soon as they start to cut back on the incoming stimulus mm -hmm. then they have this opportunity to get to know themselves a little bit I agree. and if, and to sense what they really care about and also to move outside themselves into an association with nature, which is so renewing and so healthy, mm -hmm. and something that now is mediated to us through technology. Exactly. I love to watch specials by the National Geographic of chimpanzees climbing around in trees, but the idea that we could actually be there mm -hmm. is like, no, that's hard to imagine. But you can be. Interesting, very interesting. The, also, I think the thing that happens when one is exposed to the natural world without mediation is at, at first it seems boring <laughs> because there's just, you know, there's not this hail of, of stimulus coming yeah. in all the time. I think that's important to emphasize that, though, right? Because those when you, when you first remove yourself, that's one of the reasons why you go back. You go, what? I don't see what all the fuss is about. You don't give yourself the time to actually work all that out. And then figure out what's actually behind, like what's going on around you. You go, you know what? I'm out of here. I did, oh yeah, I did a weekend away, and oh, I got bored after a while. I'm glad to be back. Yes, it's unbelievable. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So true. yeah. yeah. So uh, we found that people come to some surprising realizations, mm -hmm. and they're operating when they're on the Camino at great personal depth. That's, I would say, surprising to them. But it isn't surprising in the sense that anyone who decides they're going to go on that walk has, like as we said earlier, considerable depth of intention behind that right. and preparation. Yeah. So it's not like they're not going, not knowing what. Sure. They just wandered on the path and yeah. they're following people. Right. But I did meet one fellow who did. Oh, oh nice. That must have been quite the experience for him. It was a remarkable experience. It's going to be in an episode upcoming. Um just a, a, a most vulnerable, naked, open man you could imagine. But his life just before that had been as a yacht captain for the very wealthy. Mm. So he was used to steering around Saudi princes and, you know, the extremely, extremely 1% wow. of the 1% uh, wealthy people. And, of course, he had, uh, as you can imagine, a great responsibility running a 300-foot yacht or something yeah, like that all like over the world. Yeah, million dollar. Yeah, it's not a casual thing, and the, and the, and the cargo is kind of precious, too. Yeah. Um, so he had woken up one morning in London completely broken, completely broken. This man was in what we would classically call now, I guess in the old days we used to call it, a, a nervous, nervous breakdown. breakdown. <laughs> he had a complete nervous breakdown. He couldn't function. He couldn't do anything. The only thing that he knew that he had to do was he had to go on the Camino. How he'd ever gotten the wind of this, I don't know. See, that is fascinating. Though You finding the book, like these kind of things... Just, I'm fascinated with that kind of stuff when people say those things. Yes. You find in the book and him somehow stumbling, you know what, I got to go do this. Like, where does that come from? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right? It's a divine inspiration, you know, that's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. And, and so he just was walking in this state of complete fragmentation. And what he bolted onto 
that gave him sanity was nature and his time with nature. He didn't, he didn't talk to anybody. He didn't have a phone. He didn't have a watch. He didn't have anything. He did have, you know, the requirements for walking, mm -hmm. but he welded onto nature. And then as he went, nature started to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And when he was talking to me, he was like looking around, very concerned that somebody might overhear him saying this, despite the fact that the camera was, was mm, running in front of him. Ironically, you're being recorded. <laughs> and I said to him, well, that's what happens in the Native American tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, people go out and they clear themselves to such a great extent that nature will begin to communicate with them. And he just grabbed me like this and said, really? You mean I'm not crazy? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, you're not crazy at all. You're becoming extremely evolved. Yeah, yeah, and, wow. And uh, he was so grateful because he'd achieved, he'd found a new ground. All that's on camera, so I'm hoping that oh, we can. Oh, man, that's cool. I well, hope we can bring that forward. I got to, yeah, definitely got to see that because I find it fascinating. A lot of the things that you're, and this always happens during a podcast and always happens with my beautiful mind but there's just so many different you know I, I like to call them rabbit holes that we could go down with this yes. but uh i just really hear you had already used the word naked and i think you you'd use the word broken and it just sounds to me like you know he has no watch all that everything from his environment everything he thinks he is and everything he knows himself to be had been stripped away for whatever yes. reason and there he was left without any identity exactly he had lost crazy. his identity completely it's unbelievable. Yes. And, and then there's now, like, that's painful and awkward and uncomfortable. And that's the thing that we struggle with, right? It's like a breakup or anything else. You lost your job. Now you struggle with reality. But then what's available is like a whole new possibility, a whole new reality. But you got to right? go through a huge valley but to get there. That's right. That's the thing that we, this, this is exactly what the gist is all about, is, mm -hmm. is, is showing people you know, to have the courage to look in those dark corners and then actually ask for help and go through it. Just go through it and see what happens. Because the alternative is clear. Yeah. We know what that, we know. know how the program runs yeah. now. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. But the program as it runs now for many people is 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 not vivifying. It's not energizing. It's yeah. it's, it, it's, it's 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 tired and it's 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 wearying. And people lose their heart. They lose their spirit, you know, Absolutely. in the process. And this is no good for folks, but many of them are extremely scared Absolutely. of the alternative because they don't, there is no guarantee, there's no program, there's no mm -hmm. certainty in that route. Mm -hmm. And they can't uh, operate in that environment. They feel so incompetent. And much of that has been created and worsened by the dependence on technology. Right which I think is programming people to a remarkable extent. Uh, I would tend to agree with that for sure. And what would you say to people who are in that state? Like, how do you start to, uh, I guess, strip away all of the distraction and start to get clearer about what you actually want? What would bring you some excitement and some fulfillment? Well, I think the first thing you have to accept if you're going to even walk a bit down that road Literally. Is, is that <laughs> it's 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 not going to come to you with the bolt of lightning and mm -hmm. the peal of trumpets that's not going to happen mm -hmm. it's going to be very subtle whisper in your ear and if you don't grab that mm -hmm. you're going to miss it so i don't know what you call it but would you say that that is uh, it's we've been talking about this there's a struggle between the conscious and the subconscious like we hang mm. on to the and grip to reality with the conscious mind mm -hmm. and think we're going to figure out the problem with that but those whispers are clearly not the conscious mind yeah and the dreams of course are another channel through which the unconscious speaks very dramatically so if someone's having like vivid, upsetting dreams, um, that's a pretty good signal that uh, something's, Some, cooking. something's cooking. Right? Something's cooking, and there's for a lot of people, there's nothing cooking. Mm. You know, they're fine, they're happy, and yeah, um, absolutely. But, so carry on. So you you work at the executive level, yes, with a a degree, a pedigree, if you will, of uh, of human being that. Um, 
a lot a lot of people probably don't even um can't relate to because they don't even know what's going on at that level is there a reason why you ended up deciding to work with with them did it just happen that way it again was another um uh, wonderful coincidence Hmm. um I was a lawyer, as I mentioned earlier, and I was doing my native law career, and I knew that wasn't going to work long haul. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd started on a program to change, um, and I had a, a plan for that that I was in the middle of. And when I was 40, I met Dr. Lynn Tanner, who is the um, founder of Tech Canada, and he had the rights to tech. At that time, I was exploring the possibility of going to work in uh, organization development at Shell. And he was on my kind of due diligence circuit. And he said, I don't think you should do that. I think you should do this. And he pulled the rights to Tech Canada out of his pocket. And he hadn't gotten started. So we sort of undertook to you built it get up. this going. Wow. And um, at that time, there were 30 chairs worldwide in Canada in tech in the world. And now there are 780 or something like that. So That's very cool. Yeah. Wow. There's, um, there's something that was really notable for me, <clears throat> and that was around um, creating a base of fulfillment and accomplishment with your clients by showing them how to have mutually beneficial relationships. Hmm. There, there was something inside of what you talked about there. Hmm. The, the building of mutually beneficial relationships. What... There's something clearly missing at, at that level that ha- that really rise above as, as being something that a lot of people have talked about and said, this is what I really got out of it. Well, you know, there are a lot of models for the way people can lead. And, 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 and you know, most of the leaders, well, we all start out young. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> and, totally true. You know, as somebody yeah. said, you're young and that's your fault. Uh, well, when, <laughs> when, when people have um, models when they're young they're going to be models like their teachers like extraordinary people they've met or seen or in the in this age through media Mm -hmm. and so they they watch these things and they have no real basis to proceed because mostly they're operating off an idea and intention and they have they, they so they choose these models probably unconsciously and they just start acting that way and that isn't always the best (laughs) the best thing to motivate people to enroll and engage people in your enterprise it's uh, so some relationship maturity often helps them Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why I think people employ coaches because they want to have uh, some other way of of creating a method that they can follow or a guideline that they can follow that's going to help them get where they're going better that wasn't always the case either though was it if you look back 20 30 years ago the ceo or the owner of said company big company to if they actually took on coaches that was in secrecy that was a thing that wasn't privy to anyone because of the impression that might have left with people. Well, there's this impression that they might have been needy in some yeah. way. Or, or, or you can't do it on your own. What's wrong with you? Yes, exactly. And and there's still very much that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's an old paradigm that would likely take a, a while to crack. Yeah, it's, it's going to die hard. Uh, <laughs> it's going to die hard. Uh, but but uh, it's much more accepted now. When I started, there wasn't such a thing as coaches. That's what was so electrifying to me about the tech concept. Right. Is here is a vehicle by which influence can be imparted to these people, and, and it's a marvelous vehicle. Um, so, and you see people who 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 grow as leaders exponentially when they're in that kind of environment. Now that field is overwhelmed. There is a coach on every corner. Um, And I can't help but think, well, I don't know what these people really could offer because I think it is important that the coach be bigger than the client. Mm -hmm. Like have have more experience, more range, uh, a broader base to draw from, um, more steeped in developmental and organizational uh, knowledge. 
that they can give part of that to the client that that will benefit from it and that it'll be suited to the circumstances. And that's something that I, I wonder about sometimes. Yeah, I wonder about it too. Everybody claims to be a coach of something. Yeah. But then the actions really do speak volumes and have the ones that really make the difference rise above if you're willing to not rush into it. Because those that are, are, are out there truly making a difference in that developmental transformational space. Uh, I don't know, for, for me, there was a, uh, an intuitive pull towards uh, paying a little bit more attention to these people and being a bit more hesitant over here. Part of probably being inundated with media and being part of media, as in like creating it in mm -hmm. my business, there is a healthy skepticism and a caution and I feel like our upcoming generations that's the opportunity is to provide them with deeper context for that healthy skepticism and, and caution right that would be a wonderful thing but I think what's going on is I think as I said earlier I think they're being deeply programmed by media yeah yeah that is a challenge media and, and by whatever outlet necessary it's interesting that we're talking about this and I, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole but I got caught watching uh about five minutes of actual news today hmm. and uh, boy is anything um, happening uh, <laughs> there is a lot apparently happening it, it's really interesting it is literally like this is how it occurred to me it was like a rapid fire reel of negativity and scared and panic it, because in between the uh, whether what's actually going on is what's being portrayed. That's a side point. That's why I said I don't want to go in the rabbit hole. But between the actual news stories of political agendas and different things that were going on that way, in between, and it is literally, da, 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 they just sit there and go, bam, 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 bam. They tell all these stories. And in between, they fill it in with a, a murder and an abuse trial and a this and a that. It's It's just like... Wow. Good thing you don't do that very often. Good thing. It's terrifying because it's like, okay, if I thought, if, if this is what I was inundating myself with, I, clearly my experience of the world would be, oh my God, like hide under a pillow. What are we going to do? Sky is falling. I'm at, nothing good's happening. There's no, this is the news. This is, you know, the news. They yeah. tell you what's going on in the world, don't they? Yeah. Nothing good's happening here. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, not to get too, too the derailed to, or digress. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think that's part of, of, of the development of leaders is, is, is to get them beyond the noise of the everyday right. and into the longer time span and into the broader context so that they're not drowning in that same stuff that is uh, what everybody else is lost in. Right. Um, because they're not, they're not being looked to to, have, to be lost with the herd. Yeah, absolutely. They're meant to be ahead of the herd. <laughs> I, I, I want to circle back real quick to a, a question or an idea we talked about. You were talking about um, if you're a coach, for example, yes. being having a little bit more depth, having a little bit more experience than the person you're coaching. Now, <clears throat> that's something that uh, men at our age, people at our age kind of grapple with. We go, geez, you know, like, who am I to be saying this thing? And how do I, like, you know, doing business with someone who's got more experience than you or what, yeah. have, what have you. I, I get there's a, a level of staying in your lane, but... What do you say to somebody who who is dealing grappling with that? How do I get to the point where I'm I'm clear about who I'm leading and and grow at the same time? Well, I mean, first of all, you you wouldn't be there if you didn't have a good dose of this to start with. Sure. Um, so own that. Own that and be present with it, and don't ever let anyone talk you out of it, including a coach. Mm -hmm. um, your own instinctive uh, way is 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 valid, and you need to be very clear on that um, but I think that uh, uh, the option that coaches a good coach can provide is a, a bit of additional input a bit of additional context and perspective mm -hmm. um, perhaps again increasing the time span so that we're looking at it in a bit of a longer horizon and consider that and of course there are, you know I, I won't get away from it there are tips and traps that are useful so if you're going to go into this situation, you know, make sure you look at this first or read that or whatever. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, because you just at least have that unattached third-party perspective that 
isn't you know so concerned with the everyday you well, know, and what, what's outside. really important is that coaches have to have a successful coaches have to have a real deep streak of empathy mm. they have to be able to identify with what that person is facing and not have their agenda crowding oh that's that, so mm, that so situation. well put yeah that yeah absolutely yeah. and I, I i would say that that's what um has you pulling in that direction to that particular individual because of the empathy that is natural like it's not it's not forced you can tell when it's like there's an agenda in the background for the most part most people i would say can tell and then there's there are those that are that truly just want to be of service and help and share um it's in their nature yeah yeah and and uh i think people justifiably become very guarded and, and I think as time goes on and we're swimming in this negativity, mm. the concern is, am I being taken? You know, is, this some, is something being pulled on me? Am I being gamed? Mm. Yeah. And, and so the, the levels of suspicion rise <laughs> higher and higher. And that's another thing when we were talking earlier about this unique space that people get into in the Camino is all of that drops away. All of that that. And, and and it is indeed a blessed road. I mean, uh, uh, wonderful things happen to people all the time on the Camino. Um, and we have a saying, the Camino provides. And, you know, you would hear people say how broken down they got to a place where they'd lost their sleeping bag and all the rest of it. And somebody just gave them one. And, you know, mm. this sort of thing just seems to happen all the time. Yeah, there's an interesting thing that occurs, and, and believe me, I am as uh, sheltered as the next guy, but at least I recognize that I am. I, I want to get out and travel, and I realize that I'm. that's actually something that it scares and excites me. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there was a, uh, I saw a clip on Facebook or something like that, and it was, it was these people in a village, and it was, uh, they were trying to play a game with these kids, trying to get these kids to play a game and it was like a competition mm -hmm. but the kids like they didn't get it they just kept sharing <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't compete yeah they were just like well why would we do that that doesn't make sense why they get more that doesn't make sense like why don't we all just have some you know it was it's fascinating <laughs> oh indeed indeed it's that breadth of uh of context like to be able to experience that and and really truly realize that um what you believe to be true mm. is potentially believed as truth right here in this small little space uh, that doesn't actually necessarily mean it is the truth well look at the truths from our past that are now yeah. like are just would be like oh, it's just been completely right? challenged yeah. just, that doesn't work anymore in today's yeah. world so yeah. what's really true <laughs> it's only true right now isn't it <laughs> yeah oh that's really great yeah so to tell us more about the the the, tr the trail itself i mean you've gone sure. three times and that that clearly has uh, we started by saying the first time changed your life. Oh, absolutely. So, so let's go there for a second. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, obviously the, uh, the, the context is, was dramatically different than what we were thinking when we started off on this thing. And, uh, and Galicia, which is the final province of Spain that we're in, is much more like Ireland than what you would think of as Spain. Um, so it's Celtic, it's very old, hmm. and there are hedgerows and greenery and gorgeous rivers running through green valleys. That sounds great. It is the most gorgeous landscape you can imagine. And uh, uh, we were, you know, surprised to find out that, uh, not totally surprised, but what you do is you stay in, in, in hostels. And the hostels are provided at that time. They were provided by the municipality. And so you'd be in a room with 50 people in bunk beds and <laughs> snoring and all the rest of it. And you'd be uh, uh, going out each night to have pilgrims meals where you would, you would eat these monstrous meals that would be provided by restaurants along the way. And uh, what you got used to was this idea that this was all here laid on for you. Mm -hmm. And you were intended to walk and be in this elevated place. And of mm -hmm. course, what happened for us is what happens to all other people. And that's the, that the world falls away. The world as we know it falls away and you're left with just this simple, simple task of walking to the cathedral.
yeah, it's that whole idea of if, if somebody took away your job and your kids and your house and your whatever, it's like that idea of what are you left with? You know, like yes. what is the real value? What actually matters? What about you that actually matters? It's, it's, and of course, things can really hit you then. Yeah. The significance that, of something small. Well, that shows why we grip to the reality, right? Because, mm. I mean, if I'm just slightly doing that shoulder check, it's like, oh, no, it's okay. We'll just stay. Let's just focus right here. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. Yes. But if all that is taken away, now you have to, you're forced to do the 180 and look at what's really there. It's kind of like, oh, dear. And then these little things start to show up that grab a hold of you, right? Yes. Yes. So what was then the... What occurred for you then as you, you began know what, walking? It, it wasn't so much as a thing mm, sure. as a way landed on me. And it, I just love the who I am mm. as I walk. It's very much like John and, and the play at creation. Mm. The I am. Mm. Mm-hmm. That would be an interesting uh, dynamic. Wouldn't that be interesting? That'd be really cool, actually. dynamic to have John back in the... In the John, we met... Well, he... David knew John beforehand, but John mm. approached me at the same meeting. That oh, meeting. yes. Yeah, and, and uh, we had him on the podcast, and we had a very fascinating conversation Good. sort of about his spiritual journey as well. And it was... Uh, the seriousness yeah. we, we put towards it. and Yes. And the, the reality yeah. that it could actually be all made up <laughs> and just a game. And what would your life look like if you operated from that lens? Well, and we were in another world. I mean, we were in the European world, and, and, and it's it's so different from our context. And we don't imagine even here in this age when everything is sort of available on the machines, uh, we don't imagine how different it is to be in a European context. At that time, it was really different. And it's not that I had never been to Europe. I had been to Europe lots. But, um, you know, we, for instance, um, <laughs> they... Europe, the the Granada TV discovered us on the route and and decided they were going to interview us. And at the end of the interview, and this is just like something that you see in European TV all the time, they had us dance around each other, like with our sort of capes on and our packs and stuff. And this is like silliness. It's no, it's no dumber i guess the things that we do in north america to attract attention but mm. it was sort of like well, okay you know if you want us to do that we'd do it mm. and the interview shows us are going around and around i wish i had it i don't have it <laughs> <laughs> that would definitely be something to reflect back yeah. so we're, we're about five minutes from 45 minutes Ooh. total oh is that flies. right well okay yeah. cool yeah um what, what do you have to say then uh sir what what do I man? That was a huge download. Actually. Yeah, it's it's it, there's there's what's clear is that there's so much more there. There there always is with so all of our guests. Um, so the the presence of of just being in the moment, mm-hmm. and then you ended up going back two more times. Yes, but now the the context is a bit different. One time I went because. Um, a, a, a very good friend of mine had, I met him, he was speaking to my president's group in uh, Northern California. And he came to talk and he, I, I, I love this guy. And he was just about immobilized. Hmm. And I, I have to ask him, what's wrong, right? He says, oh, my knee, he says, it's just bone on bone. They tell me I've got to have an operation, have a knee replacement. I'm terrified of it. And he and I had been talking about the Camino just, you know, a a few hours before, and he was deeply interested in the Camino. And I said to him, if you go and get the operation, I'll walk the Camino with you. Nice. And we did. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It was really How's his knees? Great. He he walked that 150-kilometer stretch with us, and we took our spouses that time, which was a different dynamic, as you can imagine. (laughs) And then... He came back two years later and walked the 800. Whoa. Wow. So those knees are, are working out pretty They're good okay. for They're uh, okay. He'll yeah. be back on the Camino this spring. He's going to start um, upstream at a place called Le Puy in uh, no- central southern France and walk 500 miles. Wow, that is from amazing. From there into Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port. So 
like wow. I mentioned, he's on one of those upstream trails. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So, Doug, how can people find you? Well, I, you know, the uh, interesting thing is to look at the Camino channel on YouTube, and we have, I think, uh, five videos posted so far, yes. and we're letting those out as we go. Um, and for me, I'm at uh, buied at catalyststrategic.com. Awesome. B-O-U-E-Y-D. Yeah, so if you, uh, if you have a burning question about uh, maybe taking the trip, the long trip into Spain, sounds like you'd be a really great person to talk to yep. about what that might look like. We're also at Doug at the Camino Channel. Dot com. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, we'll definitely post all of that in the okay. show notes. This has been a pleasure, Doug. <laughs> so exciting to see how you folks do this. It's very well done, I must thank, say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's, uh, we try. <laughs> we try. <laughs> we try. So uh, that was episode 43 of the Just Life podcast. Oh, buddy, buddy, where are you? Do you 43. Have a, do you got a DeLorean in the backyard? Apparently. Or what? I, just, <laughs> I just traveled back in time. <laughs> back to the future now. <laughs> So that was episode 53 of the Just Life podcast. Um, we really thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.